It's now my pleasure to introduce one more time some of our guests who have already made contributions to this conference, but who will be presenting us each about a five-minute summation, their own reflections on what we've accomplished and where we may go from here. We'll do this in two waves, so joined first by the group that's sitting here in the front, and it will be followed by uh, an, another group after these. So we will first hear from Mariano Herman Mejia, President of Supreme Court Just of Justice of the Dominican Republic. Actually, we will do you second, all right? Because he learned rather late on this. We'll start actually with Professor Tore Lindholm, who is Professor Emeritus of the Oslo Coalition on Freedom of Religion or Belief, Norwegian Center for Human Rights and the Faculty of Law, University of Oslo. He will be, he will be followed by President Mejia, and then followed by Professor Ludmila Filopovic, all right, she's on the front row there, who is Professor of Religious Studies at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. Ludmila will be followed by Guillermo Garcia Montufar, Professor at the University of Lima in Peru. And uh, he will be followed by President Maud Hasbi Abu Bakar of Singapore. So we will proceed in that order. Professor Lindholm. Can I stand there or here? Uh, your choice. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you for this great honor of uh, addressing everyone in the final hour of our being together. Uh, I have been given permission by, by Cole Durham to present a point that I made in my presentation of secularism the Norwegian way or secularism Norway. Uh, <laughs> a little go. And, but I'm not uh, honoring Norway here. I'm honoring a friend of ours, Professor Heiner Bielefeld, Bielefeld, who is the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on Freedom of Religion or Belief. Because Heiner, he has again and again presented a certain normative conception of secularism, which I will now give to you. It is a little at odds with the wonderful presentation that Brett had on the isms and the it is, remember? But I think substantively it goes wonderfully al uh, along with, with Brett's intention. And here is uh, Heiner's view. According to Heiner then, in several papers, secularism is something which he then calls, specifies as political secularism. It's a normative ideal to be applied to states or to governments of societies consisting of a plurality of religions or religious or life stance communities, commu societies of religious diversity. Now, political secularism, according to Heine Bielefeld, and I applaud here, and I think it is widespread understanding of this the way we have in Norway too, by the way. That is the principle that the state should not identify with any of the particular life stances or re religious positions in, that, in the society of which it is the government. It should not identify with any of those. But it should even-handedly respect and protect and faci facilitate each of these religions and life stances, communities. So, the secular state, the way Heine Bielefeld uh, looks at it, is not at all an enemy of religion, but it does not identify with any particular religion for the good reason that it would then n not be an even-handed government of all, or, and each of them, to each of them. Uh, I think the main point then is that we can have secularism, which is not at all at loggerheads with religions. Uh, the Norwegian specification that I presented um, in this room an hour ago goes very far in saying 
the, go the government is secular by respecting, by protecting, and in an always very peculiar case, also providing financial support of each and any religious and life science community which wants to have it. I also mentioned that the Mormons in Norway don't want it, but they say we are happy about it and we're happy to share it with the others. So that is the Mormon way. Thank you, that was my summing up. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> President Mejia, please. Gracias por darme la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes. Le confieso que cuando me dicen que tengo que hablar por cinco minutos, me pongo nervioso. Porque he because I am accustomed to speak for a long time, and I, when I am limited, I feel like they are taking away my liberty. I am from the Dominican Republic. My name is Mariano Germán, President of the Supreme Court of Justice of that Caribbean country. In this symposium, I think I have learned a few important things. The value of reflection as a means of coming to know the place we occupy in the face of God. Religion has a fundamental value. Man seeks for peace. Man seeks for peace in all societies through out all history have had beliefs. Call it religion or whatever you might, but there is one belief, and that is a confirmation that I take with me from this symposium. Another conviction I take with me is how man has become divided throughout time in different, into different religions. I have my own opinion. Each one of us forms a conviction of what he sees and hears, of the things he shares permanently. What that person believes to be true becomes his own religion in such a way that true religion for each one of us is the religion we profess. And when we profess a religion, we are not interested in hearing the opinion of other religions, my own personal conviction. Another important aspect, and I repeat the same words, the important thing for man seems to be to not obtain answers from man himself. The answers come from a supreme being, and that is why we have the necessity of believing. Revelation is a continuous process. God is personal for each of us. There is no strange God. Each one of us has our own God. We learn. Nevertheless, we learn from the testimony of others. We learn from what others say. Man lives scarcely or lives seeking absolute truths. And when he finds a faith, it seems like he has found the explanation for what he's seeking. Nevertheless, when we find the explanation to what we're searching for, it seems like they call us to defend it permanently. And so then beliefs become a permanent argument in defense of what we have accepted as truth. Another aspect that caught my eye is how religion is important in all aspects of life. It is important in communication. It is important in law. 
It is important in the sciences, and it is important in the everyday life of each one of us. Only those that are truly learned, and this is something important to learn, and to learn about different religions, because only those that are truly learned prepare to know God thoroughly. And I say that the learned man is in better conditions to, to learn of God and to find God than the man that remains in ignorance. What do we prefer, secularism or religion? The modern world seems to lean towards secularism and it seems to lean towards sovereignty. Nevertheless, each step that it takes forward and when it speaks of secularism and religion and it speaks of sovereignty, it seems that it cannot let go of religion. I don't know why, but this is my conviction. It speaks of everything. They speak of everything, but in the end, they believe in something, and that is their own religion. And so, there is one more aspect I, went, I wish to share with each one of you. Even though we have a religion, we must learn to share with the other religions. What does that mean? That means we must respect them. Respect them. I was saying in an intervention yesterday that I, as a judge of the Supreme Court of Justice, have always been prepared to say in the same tone, in the same tone of voice, say yes and to say no to a believer and to say yes or to say no to a person that is a part of my religion. That is what we must prepare for. And for that, we need prudence, and prudence requires wisdom. A few phenomenons fill me with worries. They filled me with worry. Like in some countries, the situation is so intolerant that we are capable of killing because they do not believe the same thing we believe. That is if we believe in a certain belief. And forgive me for mentioning a certain case. The case of Nigeria. It left me profoundly perturbed. 118 million inhabitants in such a severe case. I have many things I wish to say, but to conclude, I want to, and perhaps in kind of a sentimental term, share a reflection with you. I say that we all believe. And sometimes I think I'm wrong. But I ask myself, and I leave this same question to you, in what do you believe? In what do in what do those that not what do those that do not believe in anything believe? And I have not yet found an answer to that. I'm going to reread the book written by Umberto Eco to see if he can give me the answer. And what do those that believe in nothing believe? Thank you very much. Thank you, President Mejia. Uh, Professor Filipovic, please. Thank you very much for this possibility to share my uh, experience. But I wanted to report today not about my personal experience. I wanted to share the experience of the whole country. I mean, the country that I represent is Ukraine. That is, 
the events uh, of uh, winter of 2013-14, those were very uh, hard, harsh and uh, sad and happy events of our country. This is something that we discussed here actually during the whole week. Uh, but our theory actually was reflected in practice. This is the practice of the Maidan, the square where the representatives of different confessions, different uh, denominations were praying. And I would like to present to the center of law and religions the uh, experience of our country, the name, the title of the book, The Maidan and the Church. The Maidan is the symbol of uh, security, securization and, the, and uh, the society. And the church is the symbol of uh, the support to of the people who were seeking uh, freedom, independence, uh, and ch the right to choose the future, not associated with communist ideals, but rather with the ideals of civilized countries. I would like to present this book and give it to your library. And also, there is an English annotation. And I would like to say that due to the conferences such like this that we were conducting for the past 20 years, where Ukrainians were participated all the time, I would like to tell you because that you chose the right people, the right uh, practitioners who came to this conference. And they can be proud, and you can be proud, that this is implemented actually in Ukraine. Something that we discussed here, we implemented in Ukraine. I would like to thank Paul Durham and all the school and all the staff who the past 20 years teach us. We are here in this great school of tolerance. And I believe that this is this uh, uh, dream of ideals that are known to all people as the heaven. And even uh, my, uh, uh, my words combine both, uh, both religious and uh, sec uh, secular words. Ukraine always demonstrated and demonstrated that there will not be standoff and fight and adversary between society and religion between. Uh, we are for alliance. We are for cooperation, for mutual understanding and mutual assistance of those who believe and who don't believe, those who defend uh, uh, secular values, uh, those who do not suffer from prosecution uh, for their religious beliefs. We are grateful to the university that united all of us here during this conference. I would like to thank the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter Days, those who, based on their own experience after great prosecutions, uh, each s family probably suffered from the prosecution. At the same at the time, they decided that their experience should not repeat itself in the history of the world. And thus, they are the fighters for religious uh, freedom and tolerance between different uh, denominations and I would like to suggest to uh, to I would like to wish you success to your church and everybody and uh, Ukraine values your experience and we are very po positive about your experience and we hope that there will be other who come after us and learn from your experience thank you very much Thank you very much, Professor uh, Filipovic. Uh, it would now be our pleasure to hear from Professor Garcia Montufa. Cole Durham requested me to sum up uh, what we've been hearing during the Latin American sessions these two days. Uh, I must begin saying that Professor Patino's presentation in the plenary of this morning very well summarizes what is happening regarding to secularity as it was defined this morning also by Professor Schwartz. So I think I'll point out three important topics only. First thing, 
the implementation of a registry for religious entities is becoming a common factor in Latin America in these days. Said registry is not mandatory according to law, but achieving registration grants certain benefits and facilitates administrative procedures before public entities. So if I take the definition of Scott Isaacson this afternoon regarding the division between academic scholars discussions and the real practical issues in the real practical issue world of Latin America, registration has become mandatory for religious entities. Uh, <clears throat> there is an interesting tendency to promote religious freedom laws in Latin America in order to regulate the right of freedom of belief granted by all constitutions. So I would like to conclude and only take two of the five minutes call granted me this afternoon that secularity is a reality in Latin America, but in many countries, the Roman Catholic Church has some kind of special recognition. The challenge to overcome is that the same benefits may be granted to all religious confessions. And finally, may the Supreme Being, God, Allah, as, uh, as we can call it, uh, takes us all safely back home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Garcia. We'd now like to hear from Maud Hasbi Abu Bakar, President of Jamia in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. I am very privileged to be invited to this 21st Annual International Law and Religion Symposium. Over the past few days, we, many distinguished speakers had uh, deliberated on the theme of this symposium, that is the varieties of secularism, religion, and law. This symposium has uh, surely broadened my perspective and understanding of the secularism, religion, and law of many countries uh, and continents in this world. The information and experience I gain from this symposium is invaluable and will definitely enhance my interreligious work in Singapore and other parts of the world in promoting peace and harmony among the different races and religion. I'm also grateful for the opportunity given to me to share how the multi-religious society live in, in a state, uh, live in secular Singapore. I believe the delegate from more than 40 countries attending this symposium will concur with me that the symposium has been so well organized and had, extremely, has, had been extremely meaningful for all of us. We are very appreciative to the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at Birham, Brigham Young University, particularly to Professor W. Cole Durham, the organizing committee chairman of the symposium. Last but not least, on behalf of the delegates, I wish to place on record our sincere and greatest gratitude to the marvelous hospitality extended to all to all of us by the organizing by the organizer, especially by the wonderful staff and volunteers at BYU who have truly made our stay here memorable. And I look forward to meeting all of you in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much to the first wave, and we would invite those of you who have spoken to please cede your places to the next group as I invite forward to join us. Professor Byung Soon Oh of Sogang University Law School in South Korea. He will speak to us first, followed by Susan J. Breeze, who is head of equality and non the no equality and non-discrimination team, human rights and democracy department 
the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the United Kingdom. She will be followed by J. Clifford Wallace, Chief Judge Emeritus of the United States Court of Appeals. And uh, then we will hear from Professor Elizabeth Clark. So in that order. Would invite Elizabeth to join us as well, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was invited to speak some assessment of this conference for past three or four days. And my assessment is based upon my personal experience in this great conference. For three days, I observed that most of the participants are ladies and gentlemen and senior citizens, and which means that this conference is a very serious business, it's suitable for contemplation for ladies and gentlemen and senior citizens not suitable for younger generation, but I hope that not only city, senior citizens, but also younger generations attend together and share the, 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 the idea and then carry on the idea to next generation. I believe that law and religion are two important pillars which maintain society, peaceful order, and to stabilize and guidance to everyday life. Modern society in everywhere in the world are suffering illness and disorder and the struggle and no peace at all. So when I attend, when I decide to attend this conference, I try to bring some package of gift to my home country. Because this subject is so important for us. In, during this conference, I observed that there was a, uh, like a medical hospital diagno diagnosis and some pres prescription was given to this important idea. For diagnosis that many people, including me, are not familiar with secularization or secularity, the conceptual difference. But through this conference, I, I was guided and enlightened that there is a conceptual difference between secularity and secularization and political secularism, etc. So through varieties of sec secularization, many different parts of the world, I believe that not only my country, but also other parts of the world are suffering similar problems. Nowadays, many societies are suffering from crisis of demo crisis of legitimacy, public trust, lack of public trust, and lack of authority. So ordinary citizens are expecting, anticipating some kind of prescription from the supreme authority in the society. I still believe that supreme court of every country or high, highest rank of the religious order seems to be a still supreme authority and supreme arbiter of social problems. For the matter of a prescription, I found the some way of a consensus or if not a consensus, way to reach a consensus. 
Let me give you a Korean example. I'm not representing the uh, East Asian uh, countries. There are many discussions in East Asian countries, regional report. But let me give you a Korean example. Korean constitution are uh, declaring that government should be neutral to religion and church and state is separate domain. But nonetheless, the religious group enjoy the uh, authority. So when the president, president of a nation participate every ceremony of a religious group, and which was regarded quite welcome because society needs some harmony and reconciliation through religion. I found that after many discussions in this conference, Norwegian reported to maintain open society. And Croatian example or Mexican example of secularization, Latin American example and Spanish example, French problem through many experience, experiences I have learned much. So I think I can carry some package of gift to my home country. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much, Ms. Rees, please. Well, when I was um, trying to think about what, what to say, uh, I was um, very struck by uh, what one of our hosts here said, uh, Dean Brett Shafts. He said um, that he was delighted to be able to welcome us all uh, to his home. And I have to say that, that that's my uh, overriding impression uh, of this conference, that uh, the, the people of the church here are very proud of their university, uh, of their home, of their, uh, their scholarly approach to law and religion, and that they've welcomed us um, into their family. Um, I want to pay tribute to uh, the, the senior members of staff from Professor Durham right down to uh, the individual students who've uh, taken time, uh, taken their own time to, uh, to pick us up from the, the airport, to drive us around in these very smart vehicles. There's no way I can imagine uh, entrusting any British student to do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, just sharing something of their pride uh, in the organization uh, that you have here. Um, I've, I've been very touched by, uh, by the, the beautiful surroundings and by the great pride that people have um, in, in this institution. Um, and uh, thank you very, very much as well for arranging the weather, which has been a, a great uh, nice. refreshment from, from the UK, from the rain. Um, the seminars, we've, we've had a tremendous variety of, of presentations from across the world, great uh, um, uh, expertise, academic expertise, um, and people like myself who are just focusing on, on practical uh, delivery of, of some of the issues that, uh, that we've been talking about. Um, and we've, I'm sure, like, like me, you've all been impressed by the myriad of languages that uh, the translation has, has covered. Um, as to the subject of the conference, um, there have been lots of helpful tools I've found for understanding secularization, secularism. Um, it seems like an unstoppable juggernaut um, to me. Uh, in a way, there's uh, a tendency to think, this is unstoppable, I can't do anything about it. Um, Understanding it, uh, understanding ways of tackling it and responding to it uh, is, is very helpful to me uh, as a policymaker and as somebody in government. Um, it's, it's very hard to stop, but my view is I have to m remain optimistic. I have to do what I can. Uh, I took most inspiration, perhaps, um, from the words of uh, Bishop Peter Comensoli. He had some very practical suggestions as to how to approach uh, secularism. He said that we had to present our reasons for having a faith uh, in the context of the society in which we find ourselves. So we can't kick out against society. We have to accept that this is the way society is changing. Uh, and we have to make our case in, in a logical, rational way that people can understand. 
But we need to propose, not impose. Uh, we can't assume that people will automatically uh, think like we do. We have to propose uh, a, a position for faith in society uh, in a rational and logical way that people can relate to. And an interesting point, uh, if you work in the UN, uh, as I do, a lot of uh, discussion is about tolerance, tolerance of other religions. What does tolerance mean? Uh, and um, Bishop Comensoli said we shouldn't go the way of tolerance um, because it's, it, it, it doesn't uh, convey any acceptance or doesn't convey any movement uh, towards people of another faith. Um, he was advocating that we should... Um, move beyond mere tolerance and into dialogue, uh, moving towards one another in friendship, which I thought was a really uh, inspirational way of looking at it. So I feel that I've made many friends and many allies uh, over the last couple of days here, um, which, uh, which gives me um, hope and uh, a strength to, to carry on with the job that I'm doing um, in standing up against the current of opinion. And I just want to um, conclude with a, with a quotation that I have actually pinned up on my computer that I find uh, helps me, um, which is that only live fish swim up upstream and the dead ones just float and go with the flow. <laughs> so I think, uh, I hope that you'll, m most of you will join me in being live fish and carrying on swimming upstream. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Judge Wallace, please. Well, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm just amazed by these uh, symposia and the uh, value and of them and the high degree of interest in people that come here. Um, this is largely because of Cole Durham and Brent Scharf. Uh, they've literally dedicated their lives to this uh, issue. I just wish I had all the frequent flyer miles that they have. Um, and and I'm, I'm certainly dedicated to them and to what they're trying to accomplish. And uh, to my left, Elizabeth Clark here just, uh, they said earlier she starts when the buses leave. That's not true because she and I were talking about next year's program <laughs> a week ago. Um, <laughs> And, and literally, it, it, it takes a full year to have these successful conferences. So I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, when I was asked to take a few minutes, um, I was asked about what this conference uh, does to me, for me. Um, and that makes it very personal. Uh, when, I, I, when I leave here on Wednesday, I'll be flying to Phoenix and doing my day job. Uh, which is sitting as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And there's some very complicated cases I'll be hearing. And what I do when I receive these briefs, uh, I look at what we call the summary of argument so that I can get a context in of what I'm supposed to be deciding. I did the same thing with the program that was distributed to all of us. And I noted the title that says, Varieties of Secularism. Now, you'd think that that's the only thing there are varieties of, but then there's a comma and it says religion. So I don't know whether it's varieties of secularism or varieties of secularism and religion. But then there's an and the, you notice there, and it's in a different color. And it says, and the law. Now, there might be varieties of secularism and varieties of religion, but this indicates that there's no such variety in the law. Well, maybe that's true just in my court, but, <laughs> but it's certainly different in various parts of the world. But I want to talk for a minute uh, about what this means to me and what it, what, how it's helped me. Um, we started this conference um, with law. It was with Senator Hatch that talked about the development of law through our legislature, which under our system has the unique and only responsibility for drafting law in a, under our separation of powers and the balance of powers. And I thought it was an interesting discussion. He did, I thought, very well and uh, introduced his issue. So now I'm back to what all this means to me in the area of law, which is my area of expertise. So I would like to say a few words about what law. Um, uh, most countries have uh, um, 
organizations in which they have drafted a document when they start. We usually call them a constitution. And uh, this is essentially a compact between people about how their governance is going to work. Um, so we have at the beginning uh, a document that indicates how we will be constituted. Now, that's very fundamental to a judge uh, because we don't work our, we should not work our way around the Constitution. We should apply the Constitution. Our Constitution was not a rights Constitution. There are no rights in the Constitution. Well, there is one right, the right to patent, which is in the Constitution. But aside from that, it's not the long rights that you see in constitutions. What our constitution was to do was to protect the people from the government. That is, our organizers a little over two centuries ago had gone through a process of having a king who, who was a tyrant. And they didn't trust government, so they thought that the constitution should protect them from government. So there are no rights in the constitution. But during the debate on the constitution, there were certain rights that people thought should be in the constitution. And that became the Bill of Rights, which was adopted in the first Continental Congress. And the first amendment uh, to that is the first right, aside from the right to patent, that comes into play uh, in our consideration. And that, that is one that, that is of tremendous importance to me because this is the contract uh, it, with the people, a contract that I should follow and direct. So um, when, what kind of a case am I going to see that this is going to, this is all is gonna help me? Well, um, it's hard to know what the variety we're, we're going to see. Uh, one thing I learned during this conference was the vast variety of secularism. I thought it was all one small package, and now I understand it's a whole shelf in a supermarket, and that I'm going to have to give consideration uh, to cases that come up that, that involve it. The other participation, if secularism comes into the court, is going to be religion. And what does the Constitution say uh, about a right to religion? or a right to secularism as far as that's concerned? The answer is nothing. Um, there's no right to religion or right to secularism in the First Amendment. What it does, it prevents Congress from establishing a national religion. That's the Establishment Clause. They were worried that the Congress might have a national religion there were religions in a half a dozen states at that time, or pro what became states. But they didn't want to have a national religion. That is, they didn't want to have a mon monopoly religion. And then the Congress couldn't do anything to interfere with the free exercise of religion. And so it wasn't that we had a right, it was that Congress couldn't interfere. Why did they not give a bunch of rights? Well, for the same thing that we've understood in the market economy, as long as you don't have a monopoly, the best way is to have free enterprise among all the competing groups. And this is essentially what the founders developed, is that there would be no monopoly church, no one single church, and all of the churches would be free to go out and proselyte, and they would be able to get those people who believe in that group, in their group, but Congress couldn't interfere with the rules of play. They were to be on their own. Well, uh, as you might know, the Congress has not always seen the Constitution the same way that I've seen it. Uh, in my view, if there's no rules of play in the federal Constitution, then that issue was left to the states and to the ballot box of the people. It was to push uh, democracy, not to push the the idea that courts should make these decisions. Well, uh, the wording uh, of intent was certainly clear, and there was no high wall of separation. That was a, that was a fallacy. Uh, it came from Thomas Jefferson, who wasn't even around when either the Constitution or the Bill of Rights was written, and he wrote it in his latter days. But it's clear the founders believed in, in um, a, a helpful hand uh, to religions as long as there was no preference shown. 
as long as there's no preference shown. And that has been documented and I've written on it and I haven't seen anything to change my mind since then. So what do we do uh, with this new um, uh, process that's going to come to us doing with the secular wave and with those who believe in, in religion, the Congress not having written on the issue? Well, I've learned a lot about secularism in the last few days. I've listened very carefully to all of you. I've agreed with some of you and disagreed with others, but I've formulated ideas. But one thing I have determined is I'm fairly ignorant on the subject. Fortunately, when the case comes up before me, very brilliant lawyers, um, like my colleague to my left, who was my law clerk uh, at one time, very brilliant lawyers are going to write to me and I will be able to be very much informed. But I am extremely grateful for the quality of the presentations that have been made. This has been an outstanding conference. And those questions that have been asked have been very important to me as I've listened. And although I, haven't I have not been very active in the conference, I want to thank each one of you that took the amazing amount of time it did take for you to develop your presentations. I can tell you that I'm better off leaving this conference than when I started. And even though I don't have a, a case in Arizona in the next, uh, this next week that deals with this precise issue, I guarantee you that I'm better prepared when it does come to me because of your usefulness in presenting all of that you have. And for those of you that have been willing to talk to me and discuss issues in your country, I've been to nearly every country that's represented here today. And it's been helpful to me to listen and see what's going on in your countries. So I thank each one of you for your valuable participation and with my extreme gratitude to Cole, and I hope you live forever, um, and, and for all of those that participated, the, the, the translators, everybody who gave their time for free because they too believe this is an important, a very important project we're all working on. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Judge Wallace. Professor Clark, please. Well, thank you to those of you who've come, those who've spoken at this panel. Um, it's been a delightful several days for me. I think it's, if it's true, as Judge Wallace said, that, which it is, that we spend a year planning this, it's equally true that I spend a year looking forward to the three or four days of wonderful associations and opportunities to learn. So thank you. It's been a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to think about these questions of secularisms and the law and religion at both the 30,000 foot or airplane level view of the broad theoretical outlines and the nuanced careful pictures of the situation in individual countries that many of you have painted. I think we need both of those and they add together to a rich picture of the status of secularism and where we should go and where we are going. Um, this has really been a wonderful opportunity to think together about the roles religion can and does play in public life, about some of the challenges that we've heard about, particular geographic locations or issues that present these questions of secularism and religion in a very troubling and concerning way. Um, but it's been grateful to think together about how all members of community can draw strength from and contribute to the well-being of a country. In the spirit that we've had of, of inclusiveness and of recognizing the value that religion plays to each of us individually, I've been thinking of a scripture that I would like to share that, appear, that um, comes from the Christian tradition. Um, and there are wonderful ones from other traditions that I wish I had as fluently on my tongue that I could use. But this comes um, from the New Testament where the Apostle Paul compares his fellow believers to um, members of a human body. That each individual is a part of that body. And he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee, of you. And as I thought of this, this is not only true 
this is true at multiple levels that we've seen here. It's true of religion and the state, that the religious believers and traditions need a strong and stable state that's committed to the rule of law to be able to flourish. And it's equally true that the state cannot say that it does not need religion. The, the religious beliefs and communities contribute to the flourishing of spiritual and material life in a community, the citizens, of care for each other, of unselfishness, of commitment to the rule of law, this sense that's been described elsewhere as obedience to the unenforceable, the ability to create a constitutional system that extends beyond the text and into the lives of people who will respect that. But even beyond the level of religion in the state, this thought of being members of a body that need each other struck me as the people who are here today. That those of us who are scholars cannot say to the government officials or the media representatives or religious and civil society leaders, we have no need of thee. And I hope that the reverse is true as well that all of us can contribute to an understanding and opportunity to effectuate the reality of these issues, of being able to have a community where all members are valued and that can live out their deepest beliefs in their lives and in, in their communities. Um, I certainly can say, after several days here, that I cannot say of all of you that I have no need of you. It's the human act interactions, it's the wonderful people that I have met that have touched my heart and friendships and opportunities to exchange ideas that I hope will continue into the future that have blessed my life and I am grateful for you coming so far and being part of this grand adventure. Thank you. Thank you very much again to you concluding panelists. It's now my pleasure to introduce you, to you our concluding speaker. Uh, you all either know him or want to know him or know of him, Professor Cole Durham, who is uh, Susan Young Gates University Professor of Law here at Brigham Young University Law School, as well as the sponsoring center, the International Center for uh, Law and Religion Studies. It, uh, I, I won't say much more except to say that it's Cole's vision that, has, uh, that began this 21 years ago that has kept it going. It's because of Cole's vision and commitment and hard work that many of us who work with him uh, who have been able to meet with many of you in, in your countries. I, I suspect that Cole has probably worked in every one of your countries. I know he's worked, I think, uh, doing these issues on every continent except Antarctica. And, when the penguins are ready for freedom of religion, I'm sure he'll make it there as well. But I'd like now to turn the time to Cole Durham for concluding reflections on this symposium. Well, I'd like to first uh, join with others in, in thanking our, our staff, our students, our supporters, and most of all, all of you who have come. I've been on enough planes that I know how long it takes to get to some of your countries, and so I, I really appreciate uh, the time. Uh, let me pay special thanks also to the translators who are invisible, uh, but uh, who I think we owe a special uh, thanks to. Maybe you could join with me in thanking them. <laughs> I wanted to, to mention them especially because uh, I, I've been a little uncertain what to say in this session, uh, but I've, I've thought a lot about translation in part because of one of the sessions I was able to attend earlier today, but also because I've thought about it a lot over time in my life. Uh, as many of you know, my background is in comparative law. Uh, we sometimes say we care about comparative law uh, actually, it's just because it's fascinating, but we, for, to be practical, we say it's because we want to contribute to law reform. 
Uh, but law reform, as I often tell my students, is not uh, just a kind of social engineering. It's more like uh, social surgery, and when we're dealing with something like religion, it's more like heart surgery. Uh, as Professor O was saying, it's uh, like a hospital, and we're seeing a lot of uh, things that need to be diagnosed and treated. But you have to be worried in doing these kinds of things. You can get uh, adverse reactions, you can get rejection, you can get uh, allergic reactions. Uh, there are all kinds of things that make uh, the work that we're talking about very complicated. Uh, one of the things that makes it even more complicated is if you think about it, you know, you usually have an image of a hospital in a surgery session, but you don't have the notion that all of them have headphones listening to different languages. Uh, and that's part of, of the reality of what we're dealing with as we look at these issues uh, across, across the world. Uh, now, in the session that, uh, that uh, talked a little bit about translation, and I'm sorry that uh, at least some of the members of that session are, are gone, Andrea Pinn, who, uh, who talked about this, uh, has already left, but uh, uh, he and I were at a conference with uh, Judge Andra Shayo. It, look, it looks like Sajo, but if you really know Hungarian, it's Shayo. And uh, uh, I've, I've known uh, Andras for many years, for, for 20 years, even longer than we've been holding these conferences. Uh, he is uh, ethnically Jewish, religiously secular, that is definitely a non-believer, uh, but someone I knew for years uh, who was a little tied down in Hungary because his father, who was over 90, he was the, really the only child that was in a position to be a caregiver, and he was every day. Uh, so it's someone who I've, and, and he's someone who would listen uh, to, to other people. Uh, so uh, there was this, uh, in, in this recent opinion, the Fernandez Martinez case, which we had submitted a, an amicus brief or an intervention, as they're called in the European court, on the other side from where Judge Chayo came out. Uh, uh, he had talked about a duty of translation. And so the question is, sort of, who has the duty of translation? And I've thought about this a fair amount. And you know, the, the, uh, in the, sort of the public reason debates, the people on the secular side say, well, you religious people have to translate into <laughs> secularese. You have to uh, explain to us. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't be in the public square. Uh, now, my, my own position has typically been, wait a minute, when you do translation, I'm not sure exactly how we've uh, done it in the other room, but if, if we're translating a book or something like that, we want to get a native speaker. So, and, and the native speaker has to do some learning of the foreign language and then translate into the native language. So, if it's secularese, it ought to be the burden of translation ought to be on the people in the secular center, on the secular side. That is, they ought to have some obligation to go and translate. They can't just say religious people should stay out of the public square because we don't understand them. There's some obligation for them uh, to understand. Uh, when we were at this conference with Judge Shio, uh, he said, well, wait a minute. Uh, you religious people have been telling me that you have some knowledge that I don't have, so that means, in principle, you're the people with the richer store, so you ought to be translating for us. And it was, it was not necessarily an exclusive message, it was just a message that, uh, look, the burden, ought to, it, the burden reasonably lies on you because you've already told us that we're sort of culturally blind to these things you religious people are seeing, so there's no hope for us doing it. You have to translate for us. Uh, well, I, I, that's what I've been thinking about, uh, thinking about in different ways as we've sat through uh, different sessions. 
Uh, one of the interesting things in this session is that there's also a problem of smuggling, that is conceptual smuggling. Uh, and, and one of the things that was interesting in this session is, is some people saying, well, wait a minute, if, uh, if people are worried that there's some religious things getting smuggled into the translation, what about things getting smuggled in the other way? How do we know that we're being really fully transparent conceptually? conceptually honest. Well, uh, I think one of the things that we have to think about is how we do translation. And the more I think about it, the more I think about the fact that it's got to be a joint process. It is, there's not a unilateral direction that the translation has to go in. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we've been working on in this conference and a lot of conferences. Uh, uh, I actually sort of started hearing notions of different kinds of secularism at some other conferences. Uh, uh, Slavica Jakalic, who was with us, was one of the speakers at another conference that I heard and I resonated with the idea that, yes, we've got to think about more types of the secular because uh, we live in a world that's mostly uh, got secular states, not entirely, there are a lot of religious states, uh, but there is a sense that uh, secular states, we need something like that to make room for different uh, religious uh, traditions, to make room for the reality of pluralism that we all live with. And so uh, we wanted to st think about what are the kinds of social institutions that will make room for the plural kind of world the, uh, that we live with. Uh, and I think we've had some wonderful uh, presentations thinking about this, thinking about ways of uh, having uh, types of government that will make room. Now, having said that, let me think, I'd like to sort of expand the time frame a little bit and just, uh, this is no doubt a sign that I'm getting old, uh, hopefully not senile, but, uh, but I'd just like to think back, uh, I think back to when we started uh, doing these conferences about that time. 20 years ago, uh, the European Court had just decided its first case under Article 9, the religion clause of the, of the uh, European uh, Convention. Uh, there had been some earlier cases by the Commission, but, uh, but the Court itself had not decided anything on Article 9. This was the Kokonakis case, which was about the right to engage in religious persuasion. 20 years ago in the United States, uh, Congress had just passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, as talked to, uh, told to us and recounted by Senator Hatch Sunday evening. Uh, Twenty years ago, we organized one of our first conferences with Ludmila Filipovic. I'm not sure where she went now, but uh, 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 that was a remarkable time in Eastern Europe where things were changing, uh, people were looking for uh, new ways of doing things. I've had the opportunity of taking uh, our university president to the place where they, for many years, have done their work. I have to tell you, I did this with some trepidation because I didn't want our university president to say, oh, you can make do with about a quarter of the space that you've got. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's an example of many people we've had the opportunity of work to work with who have done uh, remarkable things. And you know, when you think about this book, she knows I can't read Ukrainian, but Maidan, Tsirkva, uh, I have to say one of the uh, truly moving moments of my life was watching them work on things, watching the Orange Revolution on television at a distance, hearing about that, uh, sensing some of the problems of her country 
uh, right now. Uh, these are kinds of contexts in which we think about and work on and try and help each other translate what's, what's going on. Uh, 20 years ago, Judge Clifford Wallace came to our first conference. He's been at every one since, except one when he had to be meeting with Chief Justices of the Pacific, I believe. He had a good excuse. Uh, but it's, it's the kind of uh, support that has made it possible for, for us at this place uh, to do some good things. 20 years ago, Elizabeth Clark was one of the students. Uh, at that point, uh, we did things both in October and April. You have to think about this. In October, they're about two or three months before finals. In April, they're about two or three days. And in those days, we didn't have the bank of translators. We had Elizabeth translating for 40 hours for the East Europeans. Uh, so I've had some sense of what, what it means for the, for the students and what they've done, what, what she's been able to do. Tora Lindholm met about, I think in 1998, a conference somewhat like this. Uh, it was a conference that taught me that conferences are not just about imparting information, they're about building networks. Uh, and out of that uh, came, came our, our book. You know, the, this is our desk book. The joke was that it's really a desk. Uh, but, uh, but it was an, an incredible opportunity to bring together about 50 of the ex world's experts on freedom of religion or belief. Uh, and, and that laid foundations for were a lot of other things. Uh, now, I have to tell you, one of the things I learned, I learned not only about networking, uh, but we spent hours talking about the problem of how to make room for deep difference. I learned what it was to see someone trying to learn about another religious tradition, in this case, my own, uh, not one that he intended to convert to, but one for which he was committed to show respect. And I think that's part of the translation process. I think all of us have some sense of reverence, uh, and we can sense it in others. We may not understand exactly what their notion of reverence is, uh, but we can sense and respect their sense for the transcendent. Uh, and even if we don't fully understand it. Now, there are, there are a lot of other things. Uh, uh, there's a tendency these days to talk about countries of particular concern. This is the, uh, the magic language for getting in the category of egregious violators of human rights in the sort of the name and shame vocabulary of our uh, International Religious Freedom Act. I'm convinced that we need to look for countries of particular opportunity, and I need, I'm convinced that we need to include on whatever countries are on our list, we need to include our own country and our own neighborhoods, uh, because that's where we will be able to make a difference. Uh, now, 20 years ago, I was spending a lot of time in Eastern Europe. I was in a lot of dialogues about uh, what to do, how, how new laws should be written, and in particular about how new religion laws should be written. And I would talk to people about religious freedom, and they'd say, oh, you're an American, weird view, a weird approach. Uh, we, have a, we have a dominant religion here, and we have to take that into account. Uh, and then I would go home, and it was a time in this state when there was a big debate because uh, there was a debate about the constitutionality of city council prayer in Salt, in Salt Lake City Council. There was a big case going on, and there was a lot of debate about this around the state. I went to a lot of meetings, and at the end of every meeting, I had the following experience. 
people who were not Mormons would come up to me and say, we live in a state with a majority religion. This sounded familiar. Uh, and then they would say, that means we need to be particular, particularly sensitive to the minorities. And as I contrasted those, it was really striking to me because it was just really literally back and forth. But I was convinced that the people who were saying that the people speaking from the minority vantage point, that that, that was what you really had to, to pay attention to. And uh, I, I think one of the things, actually what happened was the, the Supreme Court here did a really rendered a quite remarkable decision, uh, one that really in some ways solved the issue, at least solved the political issue. Otherwise, it was pretty clear to me that there was going to be a, a constitutional, state constitutional amendment the next legislature. Uh, uh, but then what was in a way even more impressive, that Salt Lake City, having won the right to have city council prayer, disbanded the practice out of respect for some of the minority people in the community. Uh, and I, I think that's a kind of thing that we need to think about. Uh, I think one of the things, if you spend time in a global setting, it cures you of any sense that you're a majority religion because there are no majorities. We're all minorities. We just live in little isolated enclaves where we have a comforting sense of being in the majority. Uh, and and I, I think we need to work on that uh, sensitivities. Now, about also 20 years ago, I engaged in a formal effort of translation. I translated a little book. I actually looked at this and realized I couldn't believe it. It's been 20 years. Uh, it's an obscure book in German legal theory. Uh, but I thought about what that process was like. Uh, it's a hard book. It's a short, I was very grateful. It was a short book. Uh, but it, uh, in the process of doing that, I worked with the, someone who had been the assistant to Theodor Fiveg, who was the author of the book. Uh, and it traces the, the whole idea. It's, it, I don't want to go into what it, what it does, but it, it, it's, it, it's uh, from my perspective, it explains something about why the common law is really different than the civil law tradition. It, uh, it showed some of the real roots of our legal system in general. But what I'm, was con what I'm conscious of in retrospect is the many hours sitting, working on translation, <laughs> sitting with these big, thick dictionaries, and however thick the dictionary was, the word that you needed was somewhere in between the words that were there, and you needed to come up with something else. And in addition to that, I needed to know some things about antiquity and about uh, Greek and uh, Roman, the, the, their intellectual worlds, because that was in the background. And I had someone who, we disagreed in all kinds of ways, but, but he helped me do this translation. And, and I, as I've thought about it, and as I've thought of some of the phrases, I, I wrote down a lot of phrases and, and then neglected to bring them down with me. But I, but I think that, uh, I really think that in translation, we need help. We need, we need examples. We need to see what, how other people have solved the problems. Uh, we need to bring human insight into bear and to recognize that different people will see things in different ways and that, that is uh, really fundamental. Uh, the art of translation is no, not just a verbal art, but it is the great art of translating justice into reality and that that is a project in which we all benefit from working with others. It is one of the greatest of human enterprises. And accomplishing this work in the domain of freedom of religion is one of the greatest of all human efforts because it comes so close to the core of human dignity. 
Uh, the duty of translation is not unidirectional. It's incumbent on us all. We hope that the conference has contributed, contributed in some small way to help with all of our translation projects. Thank you.